All right, everyone, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, really, really excited for our next presentation. Um, those of you that have been participating in our conferences over the past few years, one really major point of emphasis we've had is to provide diverse perspectives, um, diverse racial, ethnic, uh, perspectives, cultural perspectives, but in this, and also rural perspectives as well. And that's really where our next speaker comes in. Um, Gretchen Reeves earned her master's degree in speech language pathology from the University of Iowa in 1991 and has been working as a speech language pathologist at CCM Health since 1997. She specializes in the evaluation and treatment of cognitive communication disorders caused by dementia in multiple care settings, including inpatient, outpatient, long-term care, and home health. She was instrumental in the creation of the CCM Health Memory Care Clinic in 2008, and that's really what we're excited to have her here for today, is sharing perspectives and lessons learned in really directing and managing that clinic. She facilitates a monthly dementia care partner support group and co-facilitates a bi-monthly Parkinson's disease support group. She's written several local, regional, state, and federal grants to financially support dementia services in the Montevideo area. She's considered an expert in the area of dementia and its effects on communication skills, which has led to several teaching and public speaking opportunities, including this one today, on the local, state, and national levels. Please join me in welcoming uh, Gretchen Reeves. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gagler. Well, first of all, I want to thank um, Dr. Gogler and, and University of Minnesota for inviting me to speak at this conference. Um, I'm, I'm just honored to share our experience um, in Southwest Minnesota with all of you. Um, so I want to start um, by just telling you about a gentleman who I met uh, about 24 years ago. So his name is Hans Strand. And he uh, lived in Milan, Minnesota, for those of you that are familiar with Southwest Minnesota. He was a Norwegian, a Lutheran. He was a goose hunter, a fisherman. He was a landowner of a beautiful plot of land just outside of Milan with a man-made pond that his family still lives on today. Um, he was a husband, a father, a grandfather, a brother. Um, and he was the sheriff of Chippewa County for many years, which is where Montevideo, where I live, is in Chippewa County. He was married to Gladys. And then later in his life, he developed dementia and had to move to a nursing home in, in Montevideo. His wife Gladys went to uh, her husband, went to Hans's doctor and asked her if Hans still knew her. That was important to her. Does my husband still know me? And my husband and I had just recently moved to Montevideo with our six month old son, and she knew with me being a speech pathologist specializing in communication, she wanted to know if I could help. So I went and met Hans at the nursing home. And that's, that's where my story begins. And we'll talk more about him in a little bit. So uh, just briefly, I have my undergraduate degree from Iowa State, um, master's degree from University of Iowa. So I'm, not, I'm never quite sure who to cheer for. Um, married to a physical therapist who I work with in the same facility every day and I'm the mother of two uh, grown children. Um, both of them attended uh, University of Minnesota colleges, so now I have to be a gopher at some point. So that's, that's me in a nutshell. My husband and I moved to Montevideo soon after getting married and graduating with our master's degrees. I'm sorry, to Kansas City after getting married. We lived there for five years. I worked in the public school system, but also then worked in a large uh, hospital setting, and that's kind of where I started working, dabbling in dementia care. But it wasn't until we moved to Montevideo that it became my passion. So back to Hans. So I went into the nursing home to meet Hans because I didn't know him at all. I didn't know anything about him. And he was sitting 
in his wheelchair in his room at the nursing home with his head bowed down, his elbows kind of on the arms of the wheel, his wheelchair, his hands like this, kind of like this. And I just tried to engage him in anything, a yes, no, a head nod, anything, just to get a feel for what I was working with. And he would look up at me every once in a while and just make eye contact with me, and that was it. He didn't speak. I asked him very simple yes, no questions about familiar things in his life, because I had talked to Gladys ahead of time to find out what his interests were, nothing. So as a speech pathologist, I had learned about memory books. So Gladys and I put one together. Here's hands uh, as a young person. I think he's, the, yeah, the one on the left with the arrow. And there he is on the right as an older gentleman. And there he is with Gladys in his wedding picture on the left. And on the right was their most recent church picture, Olin Mills, for those of you that are familiar with church pictures. Um, so this, this is just a, a, you know, a sampling of this memory book that we put together. So I put, got this book put together, went back to meet with Hans in his room, sat right in front of him, same posture with his head down low, his hands like this, and I put the book in front of him, between us. And he, he looked at the pages, he started turning the pages, so he was engaged in something, and we had a conversation, a verbal conversation, with this as the tool. Um, I saw some sense of humor, because one of the pictures in his memory book is a picture of his Lutheran church. So I asked him if that was the Methodist church, and he looked up at me and kind of gave me the eye. Because <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with Southwest Minnesota, but it's Lutherans everywhere. Uh, so, we, we, he conversed, we talked, I engaged him, I made a connection with him. And then we got to the picture of his, of his wedding day with Gladys and he recognized her in the wedding photo. He didn't recognize her in their church photo, but he recognized her in their wedding photo and that's all she needed. That's all she needed to know. And so it was at that point where I thought, hmm, I kind of like this. I think I can help people. So that's where my passion started, was with Handstrand. So as a speech pathologist, um, I am trained to give an assessment to look at language and memory and other thinking skills. And so I was doing that part of a medical evaluation to help the doctors in our small town of 1,500 people, sorry, 5,500 people, um, to try to help our local doctors make a diagnosis. But it was just me. That's all it was. It was me doing part of, a, part of some testing, talking to the doctors about how their patients did on this testing, trying to help our doctors know if their patients had dementia or not. And I knew that that wasn't enough. It was like one leg of the three-legged stool. So over time, over the last 24 years, um, we have developed that three-legged stool. So we have now medical evaluation leading to a diagnosis, which I'll talk more about in a second. Um, we now have community education events to increase awareness in our small local communities, and we have support. Uh, like Dr. Gogler said, I, I facilitate a dementia care partner support group. We have a Parkinson's disease support group as well. So like I said, so I'm, I'm trained to do some testing um, 
to help know if the person has dementia or not. I can't diagnose dementia as a speech pathologist, but I would give that information to the doctors. But I just knew it wasn't the full picture. There was more, I was just one piece to the puzzle. So I convinced um, one of our, our family practice uh, providers and a social worker at the time and the occupational therapist that I worked with at the time to go visit the um, memory clinic, which was in St. Cloud. It's no longer there, unfortunately. It was a freestanding memory clinic. Um, and we spent the day with them. And they were gracious enough to show us all the, all the documents that they used to do their evaluations, their process. Um, and we brought that back adapted their process to fit our needs and the staffing that we had. And in 2008, we created the CCM Health Memory Care Clinic. And the clinic is really an evaluation process. So many of you know, or you're worried yourselves, do I have dementia? Does a loved one have dementia? Um, my, my mom is starting to repeat herself a little bit. Is that normal? Um, all these questions that all of us have, right? Well, now we have a process in Montevideo where people can come to us for a full cognitive evaluation and a meeting with one of our nurse practitioners to look at the medical aspect of the situation going on because we know that there are treatable, reversible causes of cognitive decline. So it's important to have that medical piece. Uh, it's a two-day assessment, three hours across two days back to back. Um, we meet with the, with the people that bring them. So it's usually a spouse or a family member. We meet with them individually to get their perspective on what's happening and the changes that they're seeing, which is almost more important than the testing. We need to tap into the people who are spending time with them and get examples of what they're seeing going on in real life. We ask questions like, um, are there any problems with, with managing finances, getting things ready for taxes, getting bills paid on time? So financial questions. Is your loved one able to manage their medications and manage their health care? Are they driving? And how are they doing at supporting their nutrition? So instrumental activities of daily living, those are called IADLs. Those are the first areas to be affected in people living with dementia. And, so, and if the person does have dementia, they're not always gonna be able to tell us if they're having trouble with their checkbook or if they're cooking. They'll say, yeah, doing fine. And that's why a lot of people with dementia can fool their medical providers in the clinic. They go to the appointments by themselves, meet with their medical provider by themselves, and the medical provider says, how are you doing? Great. Are you eating? Yep. How's driving? Fine. How's, um, are you getting your, pay, your bills paid on time? Yep. And the doctor's like, okay. Hmm. Nope. Many times that's not really what's happening. So uh, at the end of the day two of the memory care clinic then, uh, we have a care conference. So the nurse practitioner, the occupational therapist, myself, the patient, and their whoever came with them, who supports them, get in the same room, and we share results and recommendations from our testing and make recommendations then. Um, sorry, we also had a, a memory care um, coordinator who's kind of a, plays a social work role on our team. We make recommendations to the patient and their family those recommendations go back to the referring medical provider, and then we, our team kind of steps out of the picture, and then it becomes the job of the family, the patient, and their medical provider to follow through on our recommendations. The recommendations might be, um, what, what sort of support does the person need to live safely? Do they need just daily check-in support? Do they need 24-hour care? Um, a lot of people come to us wanting to know if their family members should still be driving. And the doctor does not want to be the bad guy. Um, in a small town like Montevideo, the doctors are, 
are our patients' doctors for decades, and the doctor does not want to be the one telling their patient who they've known for 30, 40 years that they can't drive anymore because the patient will likely fire them. We've seen it happen over and over again. So we can be the bad guys um, with those recommendations. We might recommend support groups. Uh, we might recommend um, senior linkage lines, some of the state organizations um, that provide lo services locally. So we make recommendations to try to support that person to help them live safely and optimally with, with the disease. We also rule out dementia. So a lot of people come to us and we say, you don't have dementia. Something else is going on. And, and so that those people can stop worrying about it. So that's our memory care clinic. Some stats from just this year. So we do give the, the mini cog from Sue Borson that was earlier on the screen earlier. Uh, we gave it, um, it's mainly given at our annual wellness visits for Medicare. For those of you that are Medicare age, you're supposed to have an annual wellness visit. And at that annual wellness visit, you are supposed to have a cognitive screening. And if you're not, you need to ask for it. It's required by Medicare. Yes. So in 2021, our, our medical providers and their support staff gave 1,213 mini cogs. Of those, 86 failed. Of those, 60 were referred to our memory care clinic. Of those, 37 were evaluated. So it's frustrating to us that only 37 of 60 that were referred to us were evaluated. Why? Well, guess what? Dementia is an icky thing to talk about. Nobody wants to talk about it. Stigma. Um, it's, it's unfortunately has, has a stigma. Uh, and some people are just too proud to talk about it. So people will make the appointment and then refuse the day of the appointment uh, or they'll cancel. Um, sometimes they don't show. Sometimes they say, well, I'm just gonna wait a little bit. Just gonna wait a while. Um, but that was our, that was, those were our uh, stats from 2021. And the 86 that failed, that's, that, that kind of matches the statistic for people age 65 and over, about 9% have dementia, age 65 and over. So if most of these screens are being given to, at Medicare annual wellness visits, that's about, that about matches the, the national data, data. So growth. Uh, in 2008, we had one patient. And 2013, 24, and this past year, 37. So we're growing um, just as we get more, you know, more well known to the communities around us. Um, we're serving probably a 40 mile radius, um, but anyone can come to us. We're actually seeing our first patient from the Twin Cities in, a, in about a month. So we're having someone from here come to Montevideo to see us. So that's the, the medical um, leg of our stool. The next leg is community education awareness. So the, the general community doesn't know about dementia. Almost every time I speak, the first question is, what's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Almost every time, it's, it's so predictable. And for those of you that don't know, Alzheimer's is one type of dementia. Dementia just means brain failure. Your brain cells are dying faster than they should. Alzheimer's is one way that they die. So the accurate way to say it really is Alzheimer's type dementia. Then there's vascular dementia, frontotemporal dementia, Lewy body dementia. I saw a Lewy body bag down here, right? So um, just educating the public, I saw a huge need. But guess what? There's no way to pay for it. 
So I'm a speech pathologist that works in a hospital, nonprofit, but you still have to make money. And so the hospital administrator is not going to pay for me to go do a talk to a local church because I'm not generating any revenue when I do that. Um, our county social services wasn't doing it. So there was nothing going on in our community as far as educating the community. And we, I was stuck because, I mean, I could do it for free, but you know, I have to make a living also, right? So it was a, it was a challenge. That's how I felt. I kind of felt the need to put the row the boat reference into my talk today. So that's kind of my weak reference to row the boat, PJ Fleck. So what I did, eventually what ended up happening is I met a woman named Diane Osley in Montevideo. She ran the community center, our local community center. She had a passion for dementia. Um, I think a family member of hers had had it. Um, and she was a grant writer and I wasn't. So we got together. She taught me how to write grants and we brainstormed kind of what, what does Montevideo need right now? And that was back in, you know, this was 20 years ago now. What do we need now? Let's write some grants. In fact, I put that in my Christmas card, I think that year that I had written a grant and my uncle Ralph said, you need to get a more exciting life, Gretchen. Yeah. So now I'm feeling like this. Okay, I'm getting, we're starting, I'm pulling in Diane. She's pulling, letting me know what grant opportunities are out there. And I'm seeing, okay, this needs to be, this is much bigger than just me. So we started locally. We got grant funds from the United Way, Montevideo Area Community Foundation, and the Southwest Initiative Foundation. Then we went a little bigger and received grants from Minnesota Department of Health, Minnesota Board on Aging, and uh, MINRA, Minnesota River, that's our, that's our area agency on aging, Minnesota River Area Agency on Aging. So with all of this grant money, lots of things happened. So first of all, uh, we created a local dementia network and I hired a woman by the name of Lori Peterson um, to be our memory care coordinator at the hospital. And then she had some background and some experience in creating these networks in com communities. So we have a dementia network in Wilmer, a dementia network in Montevideo, which is this, um, Benson, Olivia, and Redwood Falls. And so these dementia networks are created to provide community education. So ours in Montevideo is called MAMLIN, Montevideo Area Memory Loss Network. And I remind you, this is all grant funded. Um, started in 2016, we're still going. And the people that are on our, on our network are people in our community who have interactions with people living with dementia. So it's um, managers of assisted living facilities. Um, and or memory care facilities in town, um, the social worker from the nursing home, a pharmacist. Okay, in a small town, people go to the pharmacist a lot of times rather than the doctor <laughs> with, with a lot of their questions. And, and then the pharmacist is also the one who sees, oh, Johnny hasn't filled his monthly prescription now in about six months. Hmm, I wonder what's going on and follows up. And so she's seeing, she knows people in our community that have dementia. Lutheran Social Services, our area agency on aging a representative, um, the community center, which I mentioned before with Diane Osley, our county social workers, um, a representative from the Alzheimer's Association, um, a representative from our local VA. We have a VA clinic in Montevideo and then just interested community members. And then myself and the occupational therapist that I work with from our hospital. So we created Mamlin. 
And with the initial grant money, we were, we were able to bring in pretty big speakers. So I don't know if any of you have heard of Tipa Snow. Anybody here heard of Tipa Snow? Okay, good, a few of you. So she's an internationally famous occupational therapist. Um, her website uh, is, if you just Google uh, Tipa Snow, her program is called Positive Approach to Care. We had her um, fly from the West Coast into Minneapolis and we drove her to Montevideo. Uh, Terry and Michelle Barclay, so Dr. Terry Barclay is a neuropsychologist here at Regions Hospital. And his wife is Michelle Barclay, who is a social worker and works for the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, Chrissy Barron, who is um, a social worker kind of in central Minnesota. And Jolene Brackey, uh, she came to us from Arizona, I believe. Um, she was an activities director in a nursing home and is brilliant when it comes to ac doing activities. I see a thumbs up out there, that's awesome. Um, when it comes to working with people with dementia in a nursing home. So she came, came to us with an activities perspective. Uh, and then Dr. John Brose, Brosey, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, came to us from, from Minneapolis. So we had these amazing speakers. Here we are with Tipa Snow. Here we are with Dr. Barclay and Michelle. And our churches were gracious enough to let us use their spaces for free um, for these events. Oops. Another really great thing is that we partner with our local movie theater. And so um, the owners of the movie theater have family members with dementia, so they have a, a soft spot in their heart for our group. And now that everything's digital, can be run digitally in the, in the movie theaters, we have uh, shown Still Alice, uh, the Glen Campbell movie twice, um, and The Father, which was that one most recently with Robert De Niro, and What They Had. So these are just at our local movie theater, open to the public. We advertise it. The public comes down to watch the movies. Mamlin, our group, has our table out with everyone that's represented on Mamlin, all of their materials, um, so people in the community can take that information. Um, so it really benefits the public. It benefits everyone on our, on our network. And it's going to trickle down to, obviously, the people living with dementia. Um, we did a little bit of reading books about memory loss uh, to some elementary students in town, which was interesting. They talked very openly about grandmas and grandpas with memory problems. Um, and then we did an event called Paint the Town Purple, which was a fundraiser for Mamlin. For those of you that know about grants, you can't have a grant forever. It's supposed to be seed money to get you going. And so during all of this time, we're, we're trying to brainstorm ways to raise money. So Paint the Town Purple was an event that we did over the entire town of Montevideo. Businesses took place. This is actually our oncology department at our hospital, um, Rain Purple to End Alzheimer's, so a little Prince reference. Um, and just raised awareness. And then there were places that people could donate money at different businesses in town. This was, these were some of the signs that were done in our hospital. So different departments within our hospital um, really got into the event. Everybody wore purple and did signs and you know, got really creative. So just last year now, we became a 501c3. So now um, we have a balance of about $17,000 as a group. Um, we take donations. Um, but really one of the things that earned us the most money, thanks to Lori Peterson, our memory care coordinator, this was her brilliant idea, is when we had Tipa Snow, Dr. Barclay, all those speakers, we offered con continuing ed. And so we got some money 
from continuing ed, people paying to have be able to count those hours. Um, and so that was a way that we, we were able, able to raise a lot of money, actually. Um, now, we're collaborating. We're kind of going outside of Montevideo. Um, for those of you, how many of you heard of the, have heard of the Remember Project? So another great thing to Google when we leave today. So the Remember Project, um, kind of led, I guess, by Danette McCarthy is her name, and they partner with Trellis, which you heard earlier, is the Minneapolis-St. Paul Area Agency on Aging. So the Remember Project partnered with Trellis, and they um, are a, a troupe of actors, and they have created three one-act plays. They're about 20 minutes long, and then there's discussion after the plays, and the plays are about dementia. And so it's a really unique way of educating the community about dementia. And so um, they came out to Granite Falls, which is right by Montevideo, and worked with the Living at Home Black Nurse Program. And they, before COVID, did their one-act plays in person, but our project with Living at Home Black Nurse Program was their first attempt at virtual. And so anybody could join, and it was successful. Uh, so that was a, that's an exciting partnership that we still have today and are, are working on some, some new projects. Um, and then the, the Granite Falls Living at Home Black Nurse Program, which I, which I mentioned, uh, they're just down the road. And we're, they've actually written us into their grants now to, to collaborate. Uh, another collaboration is um, we're partnering with Pioneer uh, Public Television Station, which is out in Granite Falls by us. And they are, gonna, they are in the process, so exciting, they're in the process of interviewing a physician in Montevideo who now has dementia. And so he has agreed to do a story. And for those of you familiar with, with you know, PBS, they have Compass um, stories. Uh, and you can go onto their website and watch those. Um, there's several about dementia, but this one, um, we're just filming it now. So it's a doctor's perspective on giving the diagnosis of dementia to his patients. And now he's just been diagnosed with it. And so it's gonna follow him. And, and talk to him about his perception and how he's, he's dealing with this diagnosis. So that's being worked on presently. A couple other things that the grant money gave us, uh, we had uh, Dr. Jose Castellanos, Castellanos from the Twin Cities come out and speak to our Latino community about dementia. Um, we did it at one of, uh, one of their churches in Montevideo. He came out and did a full presentation about dementia. Um, we also were able to purchase the virtual dementia tour. For those of you familiar with that, I'll show you a picture quick. So the virtual dementia tour is a hands-on way to learn about dementia. You have uh, goggles put over your eyes to mimic what what a person's vision is like with dementia. Um, you put gloves on your hands to kind of take away your fine motor skills. Um, you have headset on with white noise. And you're told to do five tasks inside a room. So while this white noise is going on in your, through these headphones, someone is telling you to do five simple tasks when you go into a room. Um, examples, uh, write a note to your family, set the table, um, find three pairs of socks and pair them. So there's, the room is set up with all these props. And it mimics what it feels like to have dementia. And so it's a nice educational tool for, um, we've done it with our staff at our hospital, we've done it at community events. So the grant funds allowed us to buy that kit uh, which you can buy through, it's called Second Wind Dreams. Um, that's the website that that dementia, virtual dementia tour is um, from. 
And then uh, four of us, so that's myself on the right, and then our memory care coordinator, Lori Peterson, I mentioned earlier, Diane Osley, the community center person, and then Tracy Wellendorf, we were able to uh, get trained as Dementia Friends champions. How many of you are familiar with that? Okay, good, good. So uh, we are trained to go to businesses to do kind of a one hour spiel, educational spiel about dementia. So uh, we, went to, we went to the co-op credit union in Montevideo, did a one hour presentation. Guess what? The banks see people with dementia all the time. They have people that come to the ATM five times a day to take money out because they've forgotten that they got money out at nine this morning. Well, now they're back at noon. They're getting more money out. And what happens is the banks get stuck because if the person with dementia ha hasn't listed anyone on their paperwork to, you know, as a contact, the banks can't do anything about it other than maybe file a vulnerable adult report. Um, so we learned that, that businesses, the dentist, the grocery stores, um, uh, the car repair, you know, the car dealerships, they're dealing with people with dementia every day. And so we started going out and doing these presentations, making these connections. So now these people in our community have, have us to contact with questions. Um, and then the reverse side of that, like at, when we talked at the co-op credit union, well, one of the co-op credit union employees, dad, her dad, she was wondering if he had dementia. And so he came to our memory care clinic. So it, we're just helping each other. So those grants helped us and is our, um, actually this year we are not doing any grant writing, which is a huge deal for us because we, Mamlin is, is kind of self-sufficient uh, financially right now. So we don't have any grants going and, and you'll see some other things here in a second that are just kind of self-sustaining now. So the third leg of the stool is support with those same grant funds. We started a program called The Gathering, which is through um, Ling Blomston here in the Twin Cities. So Diane Osley and I came here and visited one of the gatherings. So it's a place for people with dementia to go. It's an activity sort of program. And we brought that back to Montevideo and created that with our grant funds. Um, we also created the Dementia Care Partner Support and Education Group, which Dr. Gogler referred to in my bio. That's the group that I facilitate um, monthly. Thanks to COVID, we're hybrid. <laughs> A good thing. Uh, we have, we have uh, loved ones from Texas, um, Southern Minnesota, California, joining our support group every month because they have family members either living in the Montevideo area um, yeah, most of them have family members living, and so they're long distance care partners. So now they can join remotely, which is really nice. And then the memory care coordinator, which I referred to earlier, Lori Peterson, um, she has been the person that has really made all of our services work. Um, just to name a few things that she's done. She writes a newspaper article about dementia every other week for our newspaper. And these are some comments that we have gotten over the years. People only get the newspaper to read her articles. <laughs> Doesn't say a lot for the rest of our newspaper, but. Um, when people meet her, they say, are you the lady? Are you the lady that does those articles? They're so wonderful. She's so helpful. I don't know how we get through this without her. Um, I don't know anyone with dementia, but I still read her articles. I didn't know anything about services that could help us until we met Lori. So Lori really, um, her idea was the paint the town purple. It was her idea to start the Mamlin Network. Um, I have to give her so much credit. Um, but we hired her with the grant, grant money. Once she started then, she created a Parkinson's disease support group and 
that is connected to dementia because um, later in the disease of Parkinson's, people can develop dementia, Parkinson's dementia. Uh, we created a memory cafe, which unfortunately right now is not going. We haven't gotten that back up and going since COVID. Where people, there are memory cafes in the, min, in the Twin Cities. Um, people with dementia and their loved ones go to these together and they're purely social gatherings. Um, at our memory cafe, we had a husband who would play guitar, so he would play guitar every month. Um, just a wonderful experience. So, now we're expanding our footprint, which I alluded to a little bit earlier. Um, a little shout out to um, the Dementia Community, Community Action Network that's in St. Cloud. Patrick O'Rourke, raise your hand. Uh, is here today from their organization, um, spearheaded by Dr. Patrick Zook. So central Minnesota saw a need for better dementia care. And so this is happening uh, around St. Cloud. And we just, I've learned from them, they've learned from us, uh, and we're just, we're just in contact with each other. What are you guys doing that's working? What's not working? Uh, they had a conference, what, about a month ago now, Patrick? Um, um, so they are, they're providing education and support and an evaluation process uh, there as well. And then not too long ago, collaborating with Dr. Gogler with the Car Free Me study. So he has asked us um, when we have a patient through our memory care clinic who we recommend shouldn't be driving for safety reasons, um, or maybe has early dementia and, and probably should start thinking about giving up driving, um, talking to them about being a research, um, being in Dr. Gogler's research study uh, in a program called Car Free Me, which is a, um, a class that they take to um, help them get to the point to give up their to give up their license so we're collaborating with him so joys challenges there's lots of those um, challenges so the biggest challenge of course is how to get things paid for and luckily we were able to get these grants now we're at a point where we're not actually in any active grants right now but they're out there um, I don't like writing grants, so I, I want to do everything I can not to do grants, but just getting it, my service paid for. So there are a couple things out there. So I don't know if any of you have heard of the Building Our Largest Dementia Infrastructure for Alzheimer's Act. It's called the BOLD Act. Um, it was, um, you know, national, not just, not just state. So in 2018, grant funds are provided through the CDC, and then funneled out of that into area health departments. I haven't heard anything about that. <laughs> so this was in 2018, these funds, and our, health, our local health department knows nothing about it. So, but it's out there. Um, so that's something that could potentially be a, a, a source of funding. Um, also, uh, Medicare, there's a Medicare billing code. So for those of you in medical care, there's codes. When I see a patient, I, when I charge the patient, when the hospital charges the patient, I have a Medicare code that I have to enter. And for someone like me to help the family members, there are no codes. Medicare has nothing out there that will pay for me to help family members until January of last year. Unfortunately, the only people that can bill these Medicare codes are doctors, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, or um, clinical nurse specialists. Do you think the doctors have time to do care planning for their person with dementia and meet with family members? No. So it's a great, a great thing, but it's un unfortunately not being used because it wasn't written properly. It wasn't, you know, the, the research wasn't done properly on who actually provides the care planning. Um, so those, just getting things paid for, big frustrations. 
Um, but the joys definitely outweighed the frustrations. I would say a few of the joys, um, like I said, it's a small community. I go to the grocery store, I see my patients. I see my patients' family members. They stop me and they, you know, for HIPAA reasons, I can't ask how they're doing. But family members come to me and thank me and say, hey, this, what you said really helped us get through this point in his, in his disease. So a trip to Walmart is actually, you know, can be pretty fulfilling. <laughs> um, other joys. Like I said earlier, people just don't understand the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So getting the light bulbs to come on for people to understand, really understand the disease. Even healthcare providers don't understand fully what dementia means. Um, so, so getting, helping people see what it, what it really means is, is, has been a joy. Um, and just helping families. For those of you here who are taking care of someone with dementia, you know that my support and what I say to you today isn't necessarily gonna be helpful a year from now. And so it's this ongoing relationship that I have with our patients and their family members, which is very rewarding to me. Um, as they go down their dementia journey, I'm right beside them the whole way. Uh, and one of my pet peeves is, is when family members say, don't you remember? <laughs> Honey, don't you remember? We talked about that yesterday. I told you that. We talked about that. Don't you remember? So when I do a lot of public speaking to care staff and family members, that's the title of my talk, is don't you remember? And how that should be eliminated from your vocabulary. And so when I see family members, I'll ed educate them about that, and then I watch them interact with their loved one, and they say, well, mom, don't... and they stop. And they catch themselves. And, and so that's very rewarding, that they're, they're learning things to be a better care partner for their, their loved one. Um, lessons, lessons learned. So families need a diagnosis. They need a diagnosis in order to get all the other steps started, right? You need to get a diagnosis so that you know who to contact about support groups or who to, what home health agency to, to, to contact, just to, and, and maybe a medication to start on. Um, we just had a patient a, a couple weeks ago who came to us, young, she was uh, 63, I think, had cognitive impairment, looked very much like probably a young onset dementia. And because of our evaluation, we recommended an MRI, she has a brain tumor. So just going to the doctor, if you have symptoms, to make sure it's not something, well, first of all, that could be treated and reversed and make you better, but to rule out a brain tumor. Um, so just getting a diagnosis is so important. Um, Dr. Barclay, his famous saying is, um, diagnose adios and how much he hates that and so we kind of prided ourselves in not doing that so once they do get the diagnosis then they're connected to our team and then we're with them uh, and that's one of the main reasons we started the memory care clinic is this because that's what was happening in Montevideo we don't have a neurologist in Montevideo we don't have a neuropsychologist in Montevideo we just don't have that, that medical um, expertise in our area. And so the, the memory care clinic was an alternative um, to that. And we were hearing from patients who, who would go to the nearest neurologist in, in Wilmer or Marshall that they were getting the diagnosis in a pamphlet and sent out the door. So um, it needs to be more than just a diagnosis. Uh, the stigma is huge, which we've learned over time. People don't want to talk about it. You know, I talked about it earlier. But the 
bringing the movies in, having, having these, these events where the public can talk about it has really helped. Um, you know, we're known as the, if anybody has a question in the town of Montevideo about memory, my name comes up and people just call me. People call me out of the blue with, you know, my dad is doing this, what do you think? And so we get, get the ball going. Um, so say no to silos, that's what I'm learning recently. With the Remember Project, um, the St. Cloud group, uh, the Living at Home Black Nurse Program in Granite Falls, we kind of did our own thing for a lot of years, but now we're learning that, okay, Pioneer Public TV can help us, and we can help them. And the, the, the head of the Pioneer Public Television station in Granite Falls, his mom had dementia. I mean, it's just these constant um, connections that we're making now um, outside of Montevideo that I'm learning now. It's not just, it's not just in our little world. Um, it, it, there's connections to dementia everywhere. How many of you in this room have a connection to dementia? Right, almost everyone. Whether it's a family member, a friend, you work with someone with dementia, almost everyone has some, some connection. And then finally, back to Hans Strand. So I made a connection with him. And that's kind of my, in the back of my head with every patient that I see, is to help the family members make the connection, keep the connection. Um, as the disease progresses, the way you make the connection may differ. Um, but let's figure it out. Um, until very late stage in the disease of dementia, you can keep these connections with people. That's probably been the biggest lesson that I've learned over the last 25 years. So um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Is this, can you hear me? This yes. Way? Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I have a few questions here. Um, I can't see Katie at all back there. I'm blocked by the pillar, so I'm assuming she has questions as well. Um, but I will, I'll start you out with the first one here. Oh, now I can hear myself a lot better. <laughs> so um, for the clinic, are you able to sustain financially with 37 patients was the, the question. Yeah, good question. So unfortunately, the memory clinic that we visited in St. Cloud, that's all they did. And Medicare does not reimburse well for our testing. They do, but not well. Um, and, and the memory clinic in St. Cloud had to shut down. So because we're in a hospital that provides lots of other services, we're able to have that service. So it's not a money maker. You know, the, the memory care clinic at CCM Health is not the money maker of the hospital. The surgeon is the money maker at the hospital. Um, but we make enough to pay for our salaries um, and what we do. So, so thankfully, um, we're housed in the hospital that gets revenue from other sources. Excellent. I think, little sidebar here, uh, Gretchen and I met probably almost four years ago now. Yeah. I was working on a, on a study where we were going around the state of Minnesota talking with memory care clinics. And so um, we talked a lot about how your, your memory clinic runs and how all the other memory clinics run. Um, and it, it was very, very interesting because it's, it's different for every single clinic based on, on who's on the team and, and what resources they have. And, and so running once a week, running twice a week is very, very common. When I started the project, I was assuming that most memory clinics were all, I mean, that's what they were all day, every day. And that, but you, you come to find out that it's, that's not really financially sustainable for a right. lot of different clinics. You have to do other things to, to keep yourself afloat. Right. Um, and and you, can, you can go ahead and plug your article. No, 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 no okay. need. All right. All right. There is an article out there. <laughs> um, but no, it was, it was more just, just the idea of how clinics, how difficult it is for clinics to stay afloat. And in fact, I, I got your name uh, for your clinic from meeting with a clinic in St. Cloud that 
was no longer running because they, their grants had run out and they right. weren't able to, to put down. It was a wonderful clinic and offered so much, but they just could not. They it was a clinic close. that, yeah, 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 it was a they clinic where you, you got your, you know, like all of. That's how we started. Yep. It was through that clinic. Yep. yep. So, um, all right. Uh, other questions here. Do you make referrals for neuro, neuropsychological evaluations? And if so, under what conditions? Say it again. I didn't hear the whole thing. Do you make referrals for neuropsych oh. evaluations? And if so, under what circumstances? Yeah, sometimes. So, so the evaluation that I give is actually a neuropsych test. I, as a speech pathologist, I can give neuropsych tests. Um, so sometimes that's enough. Uh, if we have a patient who kind of doesn't fit a pattern that we're used to, um, or maybe has, um, sometimes we question actually a little ADHD. Um, you know, attention is a cognitive domain, but, but maybe this person has, has some ADHD that maybe has been undiagnosed their whole life. Uh, we'll, re we'll refer out to a neuropsychologist. Um, so occasionally, not very often, but under, if we feel like there's a, a neuropsych diagnosis that only a neuropsychologist can make, then we will refer out. And I also received a question, basically the same question for neurology as well. Yes, same, same thing. Same. Okay. And sometimes yeah. our patients will go to both, see the neurologist and come to us. Uh, we just kind of work as a team. Um, obviously the neurologist has a lot more experience diagnosing dementia than our nurse practitioners. Um, and so we've actually referred some patients to Dr. Barclay, again, who were, Dr. Barclay specializes in young onset dementia. So we've referred three patients, I think, to him over time. Um, some younger people that came to us with significant deficits. And dementia is kind of a big diagnosis to give. So we wanted to kind of make sure that we were right <laughs> and get a second opinion. Um, and he's actually a neuropsychologist, so we have referred out to him. So yes, yeah, at times we do. Okay, this next one, um, uh, there's a, a couple here that are more about the, um, your program with Dementia Friends going out and, and talking to the different businesses okay. in the community. Mm -hmm. um, so in that vein, um, how, how can I convince the managers of my mom's assisted living facility to provide more dementia-friendly programming for the many residents who are not ready or appropriate yet for memory care? So the, to provide the Dementia Friends program? Uh, not necessarily. Is this your question? Do you? To provide the kind of programming for oh. the residents that's f uh, appropriate for dementia care, even though they are not living in the memory care unit. Right. So from an, an activities perspective, yeah. So I'm actually talking to a, a group of activities directors in a couple week, weeks in Redwood Falls. Um, and, and the... the points in, my pre in that presentation are you have to, well, I'm, I'm a PAC certified trainer with Tipa Snow, and so she talks about gem levels. So gem levels are a, a, a different way of, of staging uh, severity of dementia. And then I'm tying that into, because most people in the nursing home are one of the last two gems, probably, and tapping into their senses, what they liked when they were younger. Um, they, they have very binocular vision rather than peripheral vision. And so teaching them about that, as far as convincing the place that they need to bring in education, I don't have a, a magic answer for that. Um, it's frustrating, even in my own community. Um, there's a couple, hand, there's a hand back there. There's a state ombudsman for long-term care, and you can find out who the regional ombudsman is for the area of where that home is in there. Uh, they work with residence consuls and things like that, and that's where you could advocate. If you, have, if you aren't having any luck directly with the management, you might try the state ombudsman, and if you can stop by and we'll give you a phone. Yeah, that's a great idea. And if, if have you spoken with the the director of the nursing home or whatever facility it is and you're just not getting anywhere 
What are they saying to you? They don't seem to understand the, the um, subtle difference between activities that are appropriate for the general population <laughs> and activities that are appropriate for folks with mild cognitive impairment or um, beginning stages or all of the folks who are perfectly uh, healthy physically have all their faculties but just need that difference in the cognitive pieces of the activities. Well, I don't know if, if where you are could afford Jolene Brackey. She was one of the speakers I alluded to at the beginning, or that I talked about at the beginning. She's an activities, was an activities director. She gives a great presentation on that exact topic. Uh, in fact, Two of the resources that we give to our patients and their families for free at the memory care clinic are these two books, and this one is by Jolene Brackey. So if you want to look at this when I'm done. And then this one uh, is um, from, the, from uh, the Alzheimer's Association, and I love this book because it's written by, um, I think, University of uh, Alabama, I think, uh, a football, a college football coach whose wife got dementia. So this is written about dementia in the format of a football playbook. It's really great. Um, so these are two resources that we give to our patients, which also came from grant money. So I'll leave this out here for you. I'd also like to respond to that. I am a dimensions manager, which is our memory care program uh, with Ebenezer. And we actually have um, a related uh, solution to that problem of having people still living in assisted living that potentially need that programming. Um, and we call it the journey program. So they can come down and it's about f uh, four hours at a time um, and have that experience on their level with programming, um, but still live in the assisted living, um, you know, if, if, especially if they still are able. Um, so that's an idea to ask them if, if they were, you know, able to bring your mom in <laughs> to a place for a couple hours even so that she has that experience on her level. That sounds really great. Right now, I am taking mom out of her assisted living to another um, care home for their gathering. Oh, good. But it's only four hours a week. Yeah. And I want to know, why do I have to take her from where she is to there instead of them bringing that program? We had the same exact thing happen in Montevideo. Our assisted living, one of the assisted living slash memory care facilities had a terrible activities department. And so when we were having the gathering, a couple families were bringing their loved ones down to the community center. <laughs> Same thing. And I tried to convince the administrator, and it's just like talking to a wall. Yeah, so thank you for sharing that back there, by the way. Yeah. All right, this question. Um, Somebody here uh, probably will want to follow up with this as well, so maybe I'll move that way, but um, are there any inroads in the Native American world communities in, 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 uh, in Southwest Minnesota or Minneapolis that you yeah. know of, and so, how can I help? So funny that you say that, because last night I stayed at the Hampton Inn, whatever direction, on University, right? And this morning when I checked out, the lady that checked me out said, well, what are you in town for? So I told her I was coming to this conference. And then she asked me where I was from. And I said, Montevideo. And she said, I'm from Granite Falls, which is 12 miles. Also in Granite Falls is the Upper Sioux community. And so as I was preparing last night, I just was mad at myself for not including that in my <laughs> presentation. But another thing that our grants have given us the opportunity to do is to do the um, virtual dementia tour with the goggles and the, all that stuff uh, with the Upper Sioux community um, home health. They have a, their own home health department, home health nurses and nursing assistants. So we've done the virtual dementia tour with that organization through the Upper Sioux community. Um, 
and there needs to be more, needs to be more, but that's kind of our little inroad um, to helping that population. Yep. Did you want to follow up? Okay. Excellent. Okay. Um, you know, I think too, as I walk across here, we were talking earlier, you were talking about stigma and and I think, you know, being out in the community as you are is going to do a great job to, to reduce that stigma and to have, you know, just people feel much more comfortable about going in for an evaluation. And, and it's just, I think it, it, it'll, it'll be interesting to hear five years from now how, what your sure. numbers are like. And, and, and I, I thought that stat was very interesting how, you know, there's 60%, which isn't bad, but, you know, like 60% of the people um, who were referred came in and it's like, you know, I wonder if that stat will move up in the next five years or so when you're out in the community more and more. And, and, and with the baby boomers getting older, um, there's just going to be a, it's just going to keep growing. And so I'm hoping that the conversation about dementia just gets easier because we, we have to talk about it because there's just going to be more and more people dealing with it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, this was another of the job related questions. Um, are you teaching risk factors for various jobs and environments for families and community? Um, and they have some examples here, like farm workers, factory workers, et cetera. No, we don't do much of that. Um, definitely needed. Another area that's needed is, is um, just healthy lifestyle living, things you can do to try to, to prevent um, dementia or at least stall it off. Um, that's, that's an area that we, we have not done much work with, no, but definitely needed. Um, this is more of a comment, but something you might want to, to comment back on. Um, in my experience, doctors avoid dementia as a diagnosis and tend to not address this, writing this off as a problem that cannot be helped. I would agree with that. Um, a lot of times, uh, cognitive health, brain health, is the last thing that they talk about in their 20-minute appointment. Or they don't even get to brain health in their 20-minute appointment. Um, and then you think, okay, well, the doctor prescribed a new medication that needs to be taken twice a day, and now they're sending this patient who may have dementia home with a brand new medication that has to be taken twice a day. What are the chances of that person, if they have dementia, remembering to take it. And so it really needs to be at the top of the, in my opinion, the top of the, the appointment. How's your brain? Let's talk about your brain, because your brain has to be healthy to be able to take your blood sugar readings, to adjust your, your um, medications, to so many things. You gotta have a healthy brain. So yes, we see that all the time. The doctors just really avoid talking about it. Or they don't have time, they run out of time. Yeah. Uh, I have a couple of thoughts along with that. Uh, we were talking about the driving program, that the study that we do here, and that's another piece of, of the, the puzzle too, that it's hard for doctors to talk about it. One, they're not really comfortable with it, like you said. You know, you have this doctor-patient relationship, and you certainly don't want to be ruining that by suggesting that someone shouldn't drive any longer. Um, but also, just that idea of, is there time to talk about it? Is that something like, and it just kind of gets, uh, I don't know, like not necessarily talked about it as often as it should. Well, and I um, think too, a lot of, uh, especially in rural communities, I mean, our doctors are lucky because if they sense a cognitive impairment or the person fails the mini cog, they, they have a next step. They refer to us, but there's so many communities out there that don't know what to do then. They fail the mini cog, well now what? The neurologist is, is in the Twin Cities, and nobody, a lot of people, a lot of elderly people don't like to drive in the Twin Cities, surprise, surprise, um, or, even, or even Rochester. So, so I think doctors, even if they do have a patient they're worried about, they don't know what to do next. Right. Yeah. In my experience also, neurologists are even very apprehensive to take on dementia. Just unless that's their forte, they, and, and sometimes it gets pushed on them because they're a neurologist. So they get, <laughs> the patient gets, set to, gets sent to them and they don't know what to do. So they kind of just, 
I don't know. I, I've just had terrible problems with that. Yeah, so sure. she said even neurologists sometimes hesitate. The, your story about the doctors um, declining to um, be the bad guy on the driving store makes me very angry. Number one, the person that they need to, to, to be defending is the caregiver who is likely to be the bad guy if the doctor doesn't take that on. Right. Yep. And those doctors need to understand that if they are going to be the bad guy and the, and the patient is going to fire them, the patient is going to go to another doctor and that doctor is going to have to be the bad guy and they're just going to keep getting the same message. Yep, it's, it's infuriating and it's not right. They need to stop thinking about themselves and, and think about their patients, what's best for their patients, yeah. Okay, another question for you. Um, actually, I have a couple here. I'm trying to figure out the, the best one to start with. Um, for your uh, program with the jobs again, was there, is the, is the outcome that you wanna see that they'll change their procedures or are you striving to give information for them so that they know how to better interact with people who come in who might have dementia or you know, is it more of like a systematic thing you're trying to, to accomplish? So I'm thinking of the bank, for instance. Would you sure. want them to come up with a policy then if they do see someone? Yes, who's, okay. right, yeah. So what we recommended to the bank was probably should come up with some sort of policy change to um, when someone comes and takes out a loan, make sure they have a, you know, a co-signer or, or even just say, if, they, if as, a, as a bank, if we have any concerns about your loved one, we need someone to call. And I, don't, I never came back to that to see if they did change their policies, but that's, that's what we recommended. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. I know we have a, a Zoom question from Katie, so I will let her take that over. Yes, uh, quite a few people online are wondering a little bit more about the books that you mentioned oh. that the clinic gives. Could you give the um, titles and authors of those? Yeah, so this one is called Creating Moments of Joy Along the Alzheimer's Journey by Jolene Brackey. She's the person I referred to earlier in my talk who's the activities person. Um, it's nice because it's it's short chapters, two to three pages. We know that care partners don't have a lot of extra time to be reading. Um, and it's organized kind of by, by behavior. I hate the word behavior. I, I prefer to call them reactions. Um, but like if your loved one uh, is refusing to bathe, there's a little chapter on that. A um, Couple other things. Uh, when your loved one says, I want to go home, some ideas on how to respond to that. So that's creating moments of joy among, along the Alzheimer's journey by Jolene Brackey. And then the other one uh, is from, you order it, I think if you just Google, it, some, I know there's someone here from the Alzheimer's Association. I don't know if they're sitting out here now, but um, it's called, uh, Hold on a second, we have it in packets because we have our Mamlin sticker on the book. Coach Broyles, so he's the coach that I was referring to. Oh my goodness, there we go. Uh, Coach Broyles, B-R-O-Y-L-E-S, Coach Broyles Playbook for Alzheimer's Caregivers. Um, and I think you can get to, if you go to the Alzheimer's Association website and then type this in, it takes you then to a site where you can order these. And then it has a little tips and strategies pocket guide also that comes with it. And that's I'll, the one that's written in the format of a playbook by the coach. I'll mention too, uh, Tipa Snow, she has a lot of videos on YouTube as well that are fantastic. Um, and they just give you a lot of good, actionable ways to approach someone who has dementia, um, particularly if they're um, in, in kind of a, 
a crisis mode or it's just it's really really good information that you can take and use and she does a lot like you you were saying how she came out to to you guys she travels all around and and if you ever get a chance to see her she is probably the most like vivacious in your face presenter that I have ever, <laughs> ever seen. And it works, I mean, it's so, it's, it's amazing how she can get everyone in the mindset of how, like, this is someone, this is how someone with dementia would respond to you right now. Yep, how do you respond amazing. to that person? And, and she, you can watch free YouTube videos by her. You just go to YouTube and type in Tipa Snow. But then also her website um, has a ton of resources and she's on all social media outlets um, she does some live stuff even, um, so you, she's out there, Facebook, yeah. Instagram, she has blogs, she's got, she's got everything. So yeah, a great resource for care, care partners. That reminds me, speaking of resources, when we were doing our project talking to all the, the memory clinics, or not all of them, but a lot of memory clinics in Minnesota, one of our questions was, what, what would your ideal memory clinic look like? What could, if money wasn't an object, what would you have in it? And the, the care, Lori, you're, like, that's who everyone would want to have. Like, have they would Lori. want to have <laughs> someone who could help that was just there as a resource. Of course, you know, with finances and, and you know, funding being as it is, not many were able to do that, but that is the absolute top thing that people said. Hey, we really want somebody who could just be there for the families, help people out, be there in a, you know, for resources, information, just support for, for people. So it's and, wonderful you have that. And we started her position, like I said, with a grant, and then the grant paid her salary, and then the grant ran out, and our hospital agreed to keep her on, even though she doesn't generate revenue. Um, unfortunately, she just had to retire because of health reasons, and so now we don't have a Lori, and our hospital is not gonna hire a new Lori. Ugh. Yeah. Yep. So, now I'm Lori. Yeah. And Gretchen. Hey, yay! <laughs> More grants. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just had a comment here that there is a Dementia Caregivers Facebook group online that is excellent. And the excellence in all caps, so to really stress, like this is a really good group to, to, to look into. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't know this group specifically, but just being in the community of people who are going through the same thing, who have gone through it and have advice, or it's just, there's nothing that can replace that or, or substitute for that, so. Yeah, the people that come to our, I mean, any kind of support group, and not everybody is a support group person, but uh, the support groups are so helpful. I mean, the, the, I, I just facilitate this group of people. They get together, they help each other, they give each other ideas, they cry. It's just a safe place to just, talk and um, I would inc strongly encourage people who are caring for someone with dementia to connect with some sort of support system, support group. Yep. Uh, I have a couple more questions or question and a comment. Um, so back on the slide where you uh, had listed out the stats for, for mm -hmm. how many were referred, there was like, um, there was, a certain amount who had not passed the evaluation that were not referred, and I was just wondering. I was just curious as to what happened. Sure, so so chances are the people that failed the mini-cog but weren't referred to us, variety of reasons, they refused. So there was a group of refusals once the appointment was made, and then they refused to go later. But but if they failed the mini-cog in the clinic and the doctor says, hey, I'd like you to go see our team at the memory care clinic, they just refuse. Got it. Um, another group, uh, the, the medical provider probably ran lab work and found something treatable. You know, a thyroid problem, maybe depression, maybe dehydrated, maybe an infection, um, and their cognition got better, and then maybe later passed the mini-cog. Um, those are probably the two most likely okay. things. Yep. Excellent. Um, I, I don't have any more. I have one comment that's just for myself. I don't have any more questions unless there's any. Katie, do you have any more on Zoom? 
Um, I'll ask another one. Yeah, so a, a question from Zoom is about that dementia kit that you purchased. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us again the name of that and then we can Google a link here yeah. and try to share it? So it's called Virtual Dementia Tour and you purchase it through a website called Second Wind Dreams. There's a woman who invented it. I can't remember her name right now. Um, I think it's her website. So Second Wind like blowing the wind, the wind dreams. And there are some, some now, some dementia experiences that you can go like online, but there's nothing like being in person and wearing those goggles and being sent into a room that's got sirens going and white noise and you have to focus on doing a task. There's, it really helps you see what, what dementia feel, could feel like. All right, uh, my, my one other comment before we stop. Uh, you had mentioned the don't you remember? Mm -hmm. And I, I was thinking, it reminded me of remember when, which comes from a totally different side of this. It's more of like trying to connect with someone. You're like, oh, remember when we, and, and I always tell people to try to avoid that term if you can, because if for some reason, you, like they're, they're not able to jump into that with you, they might feel bad that they don't remember it. They might put pressure on them to, oh, I need to remember this. They want me to remember this. Right. And it's the last thing you want. You want to connect with someone. You want to make them feel good. That's what you're trying to do. And instead, it's making someone feel anxious. Now, this doesn't happen. Like, I wouldn't say this is like, you know, like this would happen 100% of the time. But there could be for some individuals with dementia that might be their reaction to it. And it's not what you want. So um, try to avoid that, which is hard because it's really a part of our, you know, our vernacular is how we talk with people. Yeah, remember um, when we used to, yeah, yeah, it's a way to reminisce. Exactly, so, so like to make it yeah. a story. Yeah, and, go ahead. So another part of my job is meeting, meeting with care partners and, and talking to them about communication tips. And so one of the tips is to just start with I. Oh, Grandma, I remember when I was little and you helped, and, and you let me help you plant the garden. That was so much, that's, thank you for that. So, so start with I, I remember when. And then it takes the pressure off the person with dementia. And I'm not even asking a question, am I? I I'm, I'm reminiscing, but indirectly trying to pull out a comment <laughs> that, that she might remember that also and then say something about it rather than just directly asking a question. Right. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's a wonderful tip. Uh, and and you, if the person remembers, they can jump in and say, "I yeah, so we used to do this," and they yeah. can they can add to it if they they want, but they don't have the pressure to do it. And they yeah, can save their wonderful. pride by if they literally don't remember, they can just say, "Oh yes," <laughs> yep. and they maybe really don't. Who cares? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, any other tips before we? Ooh, we any other tips? Um, Avoid, uh, well, from, as a speech pathologist, I'm always thinking about um, comprehension of language. So, so most people think of, of dementia as a memory impairment. Well, frontotemporal dementia is actually a language impairment. And so it's not always impaired. But um, I think about language, since that's my specialty. So language in someone with dementia regresses in the, the order that it was acquired. So it's called the theory of retrogenesis, which is another one of my talks. Um, and so the, the analogy I give, someone living with dementia would be like if, if um, you know, if one of you in here was maybe 75% fluent in Spanish, okay? And let's say you go to Mexico, and the people in Mexico are speaking Spanish to you, and you're about 75% literate. And they start talking to you in Spanish. Are you gonna get it all? No. You are not gonna get it all. They're, because, well, why? Because you don't know all the vocabulary, what their words mean, they're talking fast, and, and you don't get it, you don't get all of it. That's what someone with dementia is like with English. 
So we're speaking to them. Tipa Snow says they only get every fourth word of what we say. Now, I don't know where she got that data, but it's, a, it's kind of a nice thing to kind of keep in your mind. But imagine yourself going to another country, people speaking to you in a language you don't understand. What would you do in that moment? You'd ask them to slow down. You'd ask them to say it again. You'd ask them to say it a different way. Gesture, nonverbals, um, to get your communication across. But a person with dementia doesn't know how to ask that. And so when you're speaking to people with dementia, it must be slow, short sentences, pauses between to give their brains time to process what you're saying. Um, it's uncomfortable, it's awkward. But just think about yourself being, put yourself in another country and how you would feel when someone's talking to you in words you don't understand. And then that's to go along with some of the speaker's points earlier is um, that can be a trigger for a reaction slash behavior. Is, you know, if someone came up to me and was in my face yelling a different language, I would, I might slug them, right? So, so I think about language a lot and a lot of people don't think about that when they're talking to people with dementia. So keep that in mind. They maybe aren't understanding what you're saying. Of course, you want to make sure they hear you first, but hearing is different than understanding the words you're saying. That would be a tip. That's a fantastic tip. Thank yep. you. Yep. Robin, can I pop in with a, another comment from online before we wrap up? Sure. All right. So um, someone in Walker, Minnesota um, had shared that Tipa Snow's training videos has been very helpful for their staff. And so want, um, wanted to make a comment um, with the conversation here that we had in the room. Um, they say to the, to the woman that inquired about her mother's assisted living facility, is it okay for you to ask what kind of training is provided to staff? I would question their on-site, their oversight and how much attention they pay to the person-centered approach. Um, so just a, a comment there. And then um, someone else asked for the name, if you could repeat the name of the Facebook group for care partners that was mentioned. If you just look for dementia caregivers on Facebook, you'll find it. Okay, thank you. And then the last online question here. Do you have a list, um, Gretchen, of talks that you give? They were specifically wondering when the next Don't You Remember session will be given. The next, which, which one did you say? The, next? the Don't You Remember. But you mentioned a couple oh. other ones as well, so maybe if you just have a website or something I can share. I don't. Okay. <laughs> um, I could, if you just want to email me, and okay. I can, or the person can email me. Um, Absolutely. Did you include a slide with me? Yes. Yes. So there, in your slides, you should have. Um, I will share that email in the chat. Mm -hmm. Oh, that works too. Yeah. There. There's my contact yep. contact info for everybody. Um, yeah, I'm more than happy to come to you and, and do some presentations for staff. Um, that's an idea for you, also, the lady with the purple mask. Um, but that comment that she was talking about it made me think of a couple other things. So, so there are Tipa Snow videos that she was referring to that staff at long-term care facilities or assisted living facilities can use. So the facility buys, or, or they're online now. You can watch them online. Um, I think I read in order to be a care partner of someone with dementia in assisted living, you have to have eight hours of education. <laughs> eight hours. Yes. Well, eight hours. And then, and then I think it's um, maybe five hours a year of dementia education. So it's very limited. It's very limited. Um, there are state, you can probably look that up, the state requirements um, for assisted living facilities and tra dementia training. It's very limited. Unfortunately. 
And I may be misspeaking here, but I believe for assisted living, this is all new, that it wasn't necessarily until the laws just recently right. kicked in for the Minnesota laws. that they needed training right. at all. Yeah, prior to that, I don't think they were required to have anything. Yeah. But now there's a new law in Minnesota. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This was are wonderful. Are we out of time? Okay. Yes, we are out of time. But so good. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you traveling all this way. Oh, well, it, I came to see my daughter and her fiance. So Yay. it's all good. Yay. It's all good. And anyone, if, if you have any questions about anything, just give me, just send me an email. I'm happy to help in any way I can. Thank you. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, so we're going to break now for lunch um, until 1 p.m. That's when our next speaker, Carla Holt, will begin. Um, just a reminder, in those folders are those caregiver registry forms. Um, those would be the yellow and the blue forms. Um, please take a moment to complete those when you get a chance. If you're listening online, you'll receive those in a follow-up email. Um, so like I said, uh, for those of you who are joining in person today, we do have a complimentary lunch. Um, so feel free to help yourself. There's four different options. We have an Asian chicken salad, a turkey bacon sandwich, Cobb salad, which would be your vegetarian or gluten-free option, and then a vegetable pasta salad, which will be your vegan option for anyone who has any of those restrictions. Um, so we will gather again at one. Thank you. And I just want to say real quick before, um, if you had written a, a question from the first panel and it was not answered, uh, come find me at some point today so that I can get your email address so we can email you that answer. I think there's like three that I still have that I haven't found. Owners too. Thanks. <laughs>